Hello and welcome to the Ian Dale Book Club podcast. I'm Ian Dale. Well, today we're going to talk about some political diaries, my favourite genre of literature, I have to say. And this is a really interesting book because although I don't play a part in it, I was kind of there at the time in a very, very minor way. So a lot of the characters that are being talked about, I know. Well, it's called... Inside Thatcher's Last Election, it's by David Young, Lord Young of Grafham. You may know him better as that. It does have a dust jacket, but I've been reading the book, so I haven't brought it with me, which is appalling. David, welcome to the podcast. Um, I was really delighted when I saw that this was coming out, because you did write an autobiography many, many, many years ago, didn't you? Um, And election campaigns, having been involved in a few... There's always things that, that happen in election campaigns yes. that are either surprising or go wrong. So I was re- really delighted that this has been published by my old company, Bite Back. And I, I remember when um, James, who runs it now, when he got your manuscript, he emailed me and said, should I publish this book? And I said, of course you should. because <laughs> I mean, he just actually, from a historical point of view, it puts a lot of things on oh, the yes. record. It clears up a lot of things. Yes. Was that your objective? Yeah, it, entirely. Um, I mean, the reason why I came to write it is a very odd one, because my background was not in politics. I, I was a businessman. Uh, I was appalled at the way the country had gone in the 70s. Incessant strikes, we had the IMF came, everything was falling out. And in the, I started doing some policy work for Keith Joseph in the Centre for Policy Studies. I w- had a running a business making real estate loans around the world with the New York Bank. And Keith came to dinner one day to talk about policy. And I I don't know what got into me, but the spur of the moment, I said, Keith, if we win, if you win the next election, I'll take two years off and come and help you start privatization. Well, he just said, done, and shook my hand. So I was stuck. And this was 83, was it? Yes. Mm. This was, no, in 78. Oh, right. Winter of discontent. Okay. I, I, I went in then. Um, and, and of course, you know, it was so bad there that I had some American friends of us ring us up one night very shamefacedly and said, David, would it be all right if we sent some food parcels? I mean, this is. United but you you say that to somebody nowadays. I mean, anybody, I don't know, under the age of 40, and they look at you as if you're mad, I can't don't they? It. But it was like that. It was like that. Everything was falling out of place. I mean, literally, bodies were not buried. Anyway, to cut a long story sideways, they won the election. I was Keith's first appointment on the first day he came, and I became his special advisor. SPAD, they're known as Mm. these days. There were four others in the whole of government. You Those see. were the days. <laughs> and I think I, I didn't quite double the average age, but I increased <laughs> it quite substantially. So he put me down in the Department for Industry. I had a grade six office, uh, a tape recorder, instructions how to dictate tapes, and left me to it. I did not see him. I saw him once after three months and once again after six months, and I found my way through the department And after a year, he must have reckoned I was house trained, so he brought me upstairs and I went up at the top floor. I mean, again, that's inconceivable nowadays. If you're a special advisor, you are effectively with the minister the whole time, more or less. That's right, yes. Um, It's changed. And I do not welcome special advisors in the way they proliferated because the great thing about the civil service was that it was a Rolls-Royce machine when I went in the end of the 70s and the 80s, was that it really was neutral, Mm. and everybody was neutral. And I I know I spent as much time selling my policies to my own department when I was Secretary of State as I did to the public. And I spent a lot of efforts, particularly in the Manpower Services Commission, where I was an alien being, really. I, I was, first of all, a Tory, and secondly, an entrepreneur. And I took great pains to persuade them that this was their idea. Give people ownership of an idea and and it transforms the situation. So I can honestly say I could not claim to one idea in the years I spent there. But, and then what happened is we ruined it inadvertently. The Big Bang came along. And before that, if you went to Oxbridge, 
the peak was the Foreign Office. That was mm. the best job you could really get. If you have, not the Foreign Office, the Home Office, and if you really finished up in the other department, well, maybe you could get transferred to the Foreign Office. Um, and then um, suddenly you could earn money. And suddenly these people could get five times the salary by an American bank coming over here, wanted people to know. And when I came back, jumping right ahead 21 years later, I saw the civil service was denuded of talent. That the many of the people left behind, I mustn't be too unkind about them, because they're not all like that, were the less employable. So going back to the sure. early to mid 80s, you, you became chairman of the Manself, Manpower Services yeah, in, Commission. In, yes. What, what did that actually involve? Oh, it was the biggest government agency at the time. It, it spent a few billion pounds a year. It did all the government trading programs and all the unemployment programs. Now, we, this is when, 1980, 81, when unemployment started to rise vertically. I give you an idea how bad it was. On the 1st of September in every year, 400 to 450,000 16 year olds went on the register and got unemployment benefit. So kids that were getting 50p a week pocket money suddenly were getting 15 pounds and later on 17 pounds a week from the state, which showed them a great message don't work, the state will look after you. But this was really a, a, a real problem. This was coupled with the fact that we hadn't brought our industries up to date since before the war, that strikes had really killed them, and we went through a terrible period. And part of what I did in the whole of that period, because I'd been an entrepreneur, is I was only keen in getting people working for themselves. And I knew, because I did it myself, that you haven't got to be awfully clever. You've got to have an idea and you've got to be persistent. You've got to continue to work at it. And when unemployment was really at its height, this 82, three, and reached that peak and carried on, um, we introduced something which I'd worked on, the, the um, Enterprise Allowance Scheme. Now, the Enterprise Allowance Scheme was the simplest scheme in the world. It merely said, if you've been unemployed, it used to be a year, then it was for three months. You had a business idea. You could beg, borrow, but preferably not steal a thousand pounds. We, the state, will pay you unemployment benefit for a year without you being under an obligation to look for a job. In other words, you can work. And that is the simplest scheme of them all. 350,000 new businesses started. Two ended up in the FTSE 100. One, a fashion business called Warehouse, and the other one was, um, I think, insurance agencies, a conglomeration of them. But that just transformed it. People could see, and I would spend my whole time going around, both at Manpower, then I became, she asked me to come into Cabinet Minister without portfolio and uh, with responsibilities for employment schemes. You could imagine my first introduction into the world of politics. Here I came along an outsider, only going to upset the present um, employment secretary because I was treading on his turf. So I learned the hard way how to behave yourself. That, that must have been quite an introduction, though, with all of these big beasts of the political jungle sitting yeah. around the cabinet table. Yes. I mean, some of them will have no doubt known you, but maybe not all of them, no, thinking, no. well, who is this guy? We got here through our political endeavours, yeah, right. and she's just brought him in. Yes, I, I mean, <laughs> it, it is, yes, I, I had a lot of that. Um, the only person I knew was Keith. Uh, I'd met Margaret Thatcher once, I, I'd chaired. You see, back in the late 70s, I uh, and my brother, Stuart, at that time, we, we, we spent a great deal of time on outside activities. The one thing I've found in life, that if you spread yourself, as long as you do it sensibly, it gives you all sorts of opportunities. So I'd worked a great deal for a, a, a Jewish vocational training, ch international charity called Alt. And in the late 70s, I took ministers, Norman Tebbets, three or four other shadow ministers, to Paris, where there were three schools, 
to sell them the idea of vocational training, vocational education. Well, he, I, I started off at the Department of Industry looking at privatization. We began to get some going. One day, the uh, small firms side of the department came to see me. And did I realize for the best part of 20 years, the number of small firms had gone down and down and down. And I knew exactly why they'd gone down. And, and for that, I want to go back a bit earlier to the time I worked for Isaac Wilson in great universal stores. My history was I became a lawyer. I hated the law, hated the practice of the law, got a job for great universal stores, which was the biggest mail order retail business of the day. And after about a year, I end up as PA for the chairman. And we were buying two businesses a week, one business a week. And we were no competitive. People were coming along and offering their business up to us. Because at that time, and all the way through until 1979, the top rate of income tax was 83%. Interest or dividends had a surcharge of 15, which brought it up to 98%. So all the middle stand, all the middle-sized companies that exist in the country found themselves. They can't take profits out because it all goes in tax. They can't take earnings because it all goes in tax. So they cheat. So the black economy flourished. But there's a limit to how much you can take out in the black economy. And besides, it gives you no security. So all they want, and at the same time, there was no capital gains tax. So all they wanted to do was to sell the business. And because of this, the whole middle stand, the whole middle side just disappeared, mm. just went. Because, I mean, in effect, there was no incentive, was there, to, them to either continue or even think of starting a new business. Yes. And that was really, I suppose, in 1979, one of the major things that Margaret Thatcher was determined to change. And, uh, and, and I tell you, I started my first business back in 61 and in those days if we go out with friends I try not to say I was working for myself because the ethos in those days that if somebody made money somebody lost money so profit was theft mm. it, it was that appalling sort of atmosphere anyway and I'm, I'm digressing a bit so what what we we really tried to do uh, the first thing that the new government did was reduce tax rates so right away it became able to actually accumulate. Instead, I, what I didn't say is if you're running a small firm in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and you make a great mistake of dying, the state duty was enormous, yeah. and the yeah. business would have to be sold from under your family. So we, we started getting people working for themselves, people training to get better skills. It was a pretty full-time job. And slowly, we slowed the rise of unemployment. And then she asked me to come into Cabinet. Um, one of the industries that I was, was the entertainment hustle industry, because tourism, people didn't realize that tourism was, tourism was a very respectable business, mm. a very respectable way for the company, the country to make money. But it, it was, sorry. <coughs> It was the start of this great transfer from the manufact from being a manufacturing country to being a service-oriented country. And I remember massive debates going on among sort of esteemed newspaper columnists about, well, this is an outrage. We, we are traditionally a manufacturing uh, economy, but a manufacturing economy that was basically going down the pan. Yes, yes. And it was in the 80s that that transfer really started. It really took place. And this whole phrase, the enterprise economy, I don't know whether that was your invention or not, but I suspect you did more than anyone to really promulgate it. Yes, it was, yes. Uh, and um, I, I would... Uh, uh, Keith once said to me after he'd retired, he said, David, he said, you just monopolised enterprise. Nobody else can use it. Well, it was not that. It was I really wanted to get... The idea across, you know, people didn't think they could work for themselves. Mm. And remember, if you're in a large company, it's, in my book, it's a rather boring life. If you're working for yourself, it's an exciting, interesting, worrying life, but in, you know, but you really fill your life. Well, let's talk about 
the run up to the 87 yes. election because you'd established yourself as a leading cabinet minister. Um, I think you quickly gained the respect of your colleagues in cabinet and you were rather good on the media, I seem to remember, which actually comes out really well in the, in the book. Um, why did Margaret Thatcher want you to take, I mean, you, weren't, you didn't have a political background. You, weren't, you hadn't got sort of decades of experience of delivering leaflets and conservative yeah, constituencies. I've never and all the rest of it. So what, what did she see in you that thought could, that, that you could make a difference? Well, she, she told me once I was a self-starter. But the fact is, my job wasn't to go out and sell the programme, to, to sell the manifesto. Norman could do that brilliantly. You know, Norman Tebbit. Get on your bike, Norman Tebbit. Yeah, who, who, we he, should explain for younger listeners, he was chairman of the Conservative Party at the time. Norman Tebbit was chairman of the Conservative Party. Uh, early on, he had been the uh, employment secretary. And he would say things like, if you haven't got a job, get on your bike and find one to get the message across. He ne to be fair to Norman, he never actually said that, did he? He, yeah. he, he based, I think his actual words were, and this was at a Conservative Party conference speech, I would think in 81 or 82, he said sort of, well, when my dad was unemployed, what he did was get on his bike and look for work. But that just, that was, that was hung around his neck forever, wasn't it? It's not important what you say, it's important <laughs> what you people write about. It. It's the perception it's rather than the reality. The yeah. Yes. So I think she, I, and she saw that I did bring home a whole lot of new programs and unemployment was now dealt with. So, so my job was to, was to make sure the manifesto was written in good time and, and was agreed by all the colleagues, that we had a whole program for television. You know, it was a really innocent age. All we had to do is satisfy the BBC and the ITV at the seven o'clock, 10 o'clock news programs, lunchtime news programs. We'd hold press conferences. So all the press types would come to us every morning so we could tell them what's going to happen in the day. And I remember right towards the end, after the election, but, but towards the end of my time in politics, I got very irritated when I was asked to give an interview for Sky News. I said, what Sky? Why, we've got news, we've got ITV and BBC. Today, of course, it's everything, mm. and, and it's completely transformed. But you would have, um, I mean, it was a very different day because you would have different ministers appearing on different programmes throughout the day, whereas, yes. of course, now one minister does all of the morning round yes. and could do, I mean, this, well, you've got all sorts of different outlets now that they have to do, not just sort of one radio and one TV. Yeah. It's dozens of them. Dozens, yes. Um, it's a very, very different age, isn't it? So when you first went in to um, help Norman Tebbit in central office, yes. what, what was that at the beginning of 87 or was that... No, a, no, that of was in April. April, the election was in, in June. Right. It, it was just two, two, three months before. And it, it was it's funny because reading the book, it seems like a long time, but uh, yes, it was only a, it was, uh, the whole thing was seven or yeah. eight weeks, and uh, in that time, I had so many dinners and had so much <laughs> champagne. That yes, that does come across as well in the <laughs> <It's> book. <laughs> but I, I was appalled. But well, anyway, I, so um, so my my job was to get people organised and and to really do it. I mean, I knew that world a bit. I'd lost my brother the year before. Stuart had been chairman of the BBC mm. at the time. He was an accountant, a man of paper, built up good factors, but it was a voluntary job like mine. And so I'd met many of the media people, I knew them. And uh, I only did a certain amount of media. You see, I couldn't go out on the stomp because I wasn't, didn't carry a rosette. I wasn't standing for election. Were you actually a member of the Conservative Party? I sat in my first cabinet and realised with horror, I could still feel it, uh, that I wasn't a member. So I did something very underhand. There was a constituency at Marylebone, uh, where I lived in London, and there was a constituency down in Chichester, where we had a weekend cottage. And I wrote to the chairman of each, saying, it's about time I joined you as well. <laughs> so... There was something else slightly underhand you did, wasn't Very there? Very young. <laughs> um, when you were head of the Manpower Services Commission, yes. um, you bought up a lot of poster sites to do um, to to do sort of posters well, in in May and June 1987. Yes. 
And, of course, that was never going to happen, was it? Well, we didn't know. We did not know for sure, but we booked them in advance. And, unfortunately, we couldn't use them. So they had to go to the party. And Saatchi's basically had first refusal on yes. it, didn't they? they signed up first refusal. I mean, politics... I mean, business can be a bit of a dirty game, can't it? But politics well, can dirty. be as well. Did, did, do you regard that as fair game? Yes, I do. I, that, that's, that's just looking ahead. But it's something that the Labour Party could never have done. It wasn't an equal playing field, was it? Well, I think... I, um, <laughs> they could have. They could have. They could have taken the ball kickings. You don't pay in advance. Mm. They would have to take a gamble. And you've got to have some advantages of being in, in power. Not many. And the Labour Party always thinks that the media is in the hands of the Conservatives, that they've got all this access to rich donors' money. Um, and there is an element of truth in that, but y you, you talk a lot about the media handling I in the diary. Um, and there's some quite entertaining episodes about the BBC where you sort of had to ring them up and complain about various things. But I ITN seemed to be, shall we say, more in your pocket... Well, not more in our pocket, more middle of the road, you <laughs> see. Look, we were all convinced that all the media were hopelessly left-wing. They were all convinced it's hopelessly right-wing. I remember my brother saying to me once when he was the BBC, that when the pile of complaints are roughly level, you'll know you're doing all right. I always think it's a really lazy argument. Because, <laughs> um, I mean, it just... It just means that you, you become very complacent and you, and you don't really take on board any of the criticisms that are yes. made. I, I agree with that completely. I mean, I have been worried for quite a while that the BBC represents a smaller segment of the... I'm being as diplomatic as I can, a smaller segment of the population than it used to in the old days. In other words, it's become woke. It's become, in uh, many ways, the news programmes. I think in particular, but that's a personal view. Now, you, in politics, you always tend to believe the opposition more than you believe your own side. It's a very odd thing. Mm. You know, if somebody says something, you think, oh, I don't, that's one of our side. I'm not sure that's right. But if the other side say it, you get worried. Do, do you feel that, in a way, you played the same role that Cecil Parkinson played in 1983, in that you... Part of, you were there, I mean, she would never have thought of it in this way, but I suspect that your colleagues knew that you were quite good at managing Margaret Thatcher. Yeah. And you were, she, how can I put this, um, she quite liked sort of dashing, good-looking men. Well, and you're talking about a long time well, ago yeah, now. But, yes. I mean, you just look <laughs> at the pictures and you, you can see. Yes. And Cecil Parkinson was brilliant at that. And, yes. I mean, it's clear from the diary, so were you. Yes. Yeah, well, yeah, I, it worked, yes. <laughs> she, um, look, at the end of the day, I'm not allowed to say this anymore, but she was a woman. She looked for reassurance from time to... Now, she was not the Iron Lady that... Mm. that, that she, she, was, she was a human being. There's one passage towards the end of the book where you she didn't want to have a confrontation with Norman Tebbett and yeah. basically said, well, you've got to have it. And you, you write that and this was the Iron Lady afraid of having a confrontation with her party chairman. Well, she did it far worse things to me. For example, she said to me about 12, 15, two weeks before the election day, David, I want you to take over all television appearances. So I said, right, Prime Minister, of course, uh, will you tell John Wakeham? Oh, yes, yes, he said. Because he was doing that before. He was yeah. doing that job. He was, mm. And he'd appeared on television, and it was an unfortunate interview, and, and people realised that perhaps... Yeah. So the next day came. She hadn't spoken to him. I went to see her. I said, have you spoken to John? Oh, yes, yes, I'll speak to him. But she never did. And eventually I had to walk in to John and create an enemy for life because I had to walk in and just take it, take it over. And that happened two or three times. She was actually a very bad man manager. She she hated telling people bad things, you know, bad news, or, mm. or criticised a person. Which goes completely against what people think, yeah. doesn't it? Which is one of the reasons I wanted to publish the diary, 
because it's one of the few accounts that, that really shows what she's like day to day under stress. I mean, if I'd have written about the election, even two years later, it would have been an entirely different book. Yeah. Everything would have seemed planned and, you know, instead of being quite haphazard. I remember that election campaign. I, I was 24 years old, um, managing a campaign in a marginal seat in Norwich. And I remember reading about all of these supposed spats in, within central office and how it was all go the campaign was seen as a bit of a disaster by some people and Margaret Thatcher was tearing her hair out. And I can remember thinking at the time, well, I don't know what's so disastrous about it because on the ground, I mean, we're going to increase the majority in the marginal seat, which we duly did. Yes. But when you're at the centre, do you think that it's very difficult to get perspective? Well, there was another reason. She won three elections. The first election broke the mould. The first woman prime minister, and much more important, the first Conservative government that was interested in enterprise. It had a monetary, not, not the control, five, six of the MPs. The second election was important because it was the most left-wing manifesto, even worse than Corbyn's that last election. Mm. Um, and we won it so decisively that there hasn't been a left-wing attempt again until Corbyn and, and that went. And it was only after that election, A, she got control of the cabinet. She now had sufficient number of, of, of ministers that, that she could get what she wanted. And the economy started to move. Startups came along. The, everything started to look right. Then along comes Kinnock with all the latest marketing techniques. Their television commercials were years yeah. ahead of ours. And But in their manifesto, they said three things. We're going to privatize every... Na we're going to nationalize every privatized business, is, is, is the first one. Secondly, we're going to give the unions back their privileges so the strikes will come back. And the third one is, in the aid of equity, we're going to put the tax back to where it was. So if we'd have lost that election, we'd have gone right back to the beginning again. And it was that thing that obsessed all of us because we knew... We, now, what we never dreamt is we would win quite as convincingly as we did win. And, and indeed, nobody believed it. In fact, uh, I must tell you, even on election night, I did the first, uh, the, the first lot on the election broadcast. And before the election, I went into the green room at the BBC, and it was a party. There was champagne over the place, everything but streamers. Everybody was in a very good mood, you see. Now, Alistair McAlpine had told me the result of... He was, he was a party treasurer. He was the party treasurer, and had let me know before I came on the result of a very private poll which showed that we were going to win by 60 minimum. But when we came in, everyone at the BBC told us it's going to be a hung election, it's going to be very close. You could lose, but equally Labour could win. And then at the beginning, when they have all the, you know, the first introduction and going well, the whole thing was this is very, very close. So eventually, I'm trying to remember who chaired at that time, I slipped them a note when they, they'd got themselves Rob, Robin dug Day, in. I think, wasn't it? No, it wasn't Robert Taylor. It was no, the, Robin, Robin Day. Yes. When they dug themselves into a nice deep hole, I slipped them a note said, our poll shows we're winning by 60. And they suddenly changed. And just then, the first result came up. And they said, if the Conservatives, which is a safe seat, if the Conservatives get 26,000 votes, then, then it's very close, and we got just under 30. So, and I finished about, this was two, three hours into the thing, I finished a few minutes later, went back to the green room, and it was awoke. Awake, rather. Awake. Awake. It awoke, was sitting wake. there, looking at their <laughs> coffee, glum as anything. <laughs> the story had gone away. Yeah. You see. Um, there were some great personalities involved in that campaign, weren't there? I mean, within central office as well as household names. And, and you detail all of the press conferences, um, which, again, just don't have any more in general elections. No. They, there was a sense of occasion, and you would have serious journalists 
asking serious yeah. questions rather than these incessant gotcha type questions which we get oh. now. It is at the press conference that the Boris holds at number 10. The questions are appalling. We wouldn't have put up with it in, mm. in our time. No, the, the, there was a lot of tension in, in press conferences in the morning because one wrong word could ruin the whole day's campaigning and two consecutive wrong words could ruin the whole thing. And there was one occasion where she was, Margaret Thatcher was asked about private health, wasn't there? And, and she said, well, I use private health because I want the doctor I want at the time I want in the hospital I want. And I can remember thinking at the time, well, that's a brave one. <laughs> yes, yes, that really was. I mean, it, it, this was the very early days of mobile phones, and I kitted everybody out with these great big clunky yeah. mobile phones. And then somebody said something wrong. I think it was Margaret again, or somebody, about education and about the difference between public and private. And Ken Baker was the education secretary, and he was out. And I was trying desperately to get a hold of him for two and a half hours. He had the phone, but he hadn't switched it on. Ken, Ken Clark is still like that, yes. 40 years old. <laughs> oh, yes, that's right, exactly. What was he like to work with? Because he was effectively your deputy, wasn't he, when you he first was, came into government? Yes. He was my vicar on earth. Yes, in yeah. the Commons. Yeah. In the Commons, yes, that's right. It, it was Well, we got on very well, personally. Um, he was... Uh, very leftish, I was a bit rightish, but we fundamentally believed in the same thing about an enterprise economy. Uh, and th there's one marvellous occasion I talked into, it was um, when, when I became Secretary of State for Employment and Ken was my um, Minister of State and uh, we, we had one early meeting we were going through the budget for the department, been going on for two days. Eventually, on the second day, it's approaching lunchtime, and the permanent secretary thought he could play one of the tricks that they're famous for, and said to me, oh, Secretary of State, you, you've got a lunch appointment, haven't you? And I said, yes, I, I have. He said, well, may, maybe Mr. Clark will take the, the last part, which was all about pay of rations. And I said, yes, that's a good idea. Let's do that. And I went off, and I know Ken was much more rigorous than I was. I'm a softy in comparison. When I came back, an ashen-faced permanent secretary <laughs> came to me, said, what can we do? He's done this, he's done that. Because well, isn't it funny how Ken Clark has developed this reputation, a bit like Dennis Healy did, yes. as this sort of avuncular figure, sort of everybody's friend. And yet, if you think back to the mid to late 1980s, and indeed his time as chancellor, he was as tough as old boots. He was a great chancellor. He really was, and, and it's tough. You think back to the ambulance dispute as well, when he was health secretary. Yes. I mean, he could not have been I know. more sort of... Well, well, he knew what was right, and, and, that, and that was it. It was, um, yes, it, I, I enjoyed very much working. With, in fact, I enjoyed working with my colleagues. Yes, you are right, there was a certain amount of um, second glances at, at me, who's this chap coming, swanning in, but that didn't last too long. It had a reoccurrence when, when somehow the papers quoted her saying that other ministers bring me problems, David brings me solutions or mm. something like that, which I never heard her say. And I must tell you, the next time I walked into Cabinet, it had just started, you felt the temperature drop. <laughs> it did not endear me to my colleagues. But oh, you did have that reputation, and I remember that being said. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I don't think she ever said it in public, did she? But it was it was reported. But there are time and time again in these diaries, which remember we should remember cover just over a month, yeah. where there was a there was a problem, and you solved it, yeah. and you gave her the reassurance that you were going to solve it, and yeah. she had implicit trust in you to yeah. do that, which she didn't have in many people. No, no. Um, well, you see, I I could be tougher than most in a way because I knew I was not long-term in politics. And besides, I'd, I'd run the things before and I ran things afterwards, of course. Um, and, and I was desperate. We were actually desperate about the result of the election because if we'd have lost, this country would not be this country today. Mm. You know, it, it really wouldn't.
And there were a couple of occasions, which, which you again mentioned in the book, about there was a little bit of press speculation that you could succeed her, yes. um, which being a life peer would have been incredibly difficult to do. But of course, if that had gained any currency, your political been. position would have been very well, difficult. One day after the election, Alan Clark took me out to books for dinner. And over coffee, he said, David, enough, we'd like you to follow her. He said, you'd be acceptable on both sides of the party. And meanwhile, alarm bells rang. And he said, we are quite prepared to bring in a private bill to, and we'll, we'll get you a seat and bring you in. I knew that if I did that, I'd be dead in the next week. Not mm. literally dead, but politically dead. Because the great advantage that I presented to her is I could not be a rival. Yeah. You know, and aging lions, and towards the end, she was an aging lion. Mm. You know, she'd been there. I mean, people forget she'd been leader of the party in opposition for five years. And at this stage, she'd been prime minister for eight years. Prime Minister over the Falklands, Prime Minister over the IMF with all the problems we'd had. And she, I've never come across, I always had this feeling when I went to see her that somehow she knew more about what was going on in, in our, my department than I did because she read every bit of paper and, and she had you know, an unbelievable work ethic. Let's turn to your relations with Norman Tebbett, yeah. which before I read the book, I, I had expected there to be a lot more sort of explosions, yeah. but you managed it, you managed that relationship in such a way that there weren't really, in fact, yeah. the only explosion was on your part at one point. Yes, yeah, it was on mine. Well, you grabbed him by the lapels. You see, brave man. <laughs> I, the problem wasn't between Norman and I. Norman and I got on very well in the, when I worked for him. In, the problem was that Tim Bell had worked for Sarches and had won the last two elections for her. And then he pulled out with Sarches and set up his own firm. Uh, but Sarches had the contract with the party. And Sarches, Sarches brothers hated Tim. I mean, they, 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 mm. he was a traitor. And so they would go mad if there was any question of Tim even seeing Margaret. So, we had to smuggle her in to check us and smuggle. And Norman was very much in the Sarchi thing. Over such silly things, a grown men playing games at. I mean, it was silly. And at the point of Wobble Thursday, it is true, we, we believe there was a poll coming in that showed there were quarters up to 2%. And if we're within 2% a week before the election, that is serious because that would invigorate everybody else on the other side. Uh, and she didn't like this program. She was tired. She had a toothache. And what I thought she needed more than anything else was her confidence. Mm. So I was determined well, whether Tim's program was better than the other one, I don't know. She thought it was better. Well, because let's explain that he had created an advertising campaign for the last few days yes. of the campaign. Sarchi's had done a, a different one. You saw Tim Bell's first thought, that is brilliant, and then saw Sarchi's thought, don't like that at all. And your mission, set by her, I was guess, to was to persuade Norman to go with the go with it. Bell one, and he yeah. did, in and the he end. Did. He did. He but did. tell us about the altercation. <laughs> well, we were... Well, what, what, what had happened is she hated the Sarchi program. So I rang up Tim the day before, and he worked through the night, and they got a program out, boards on, on uh, and I looked at it, and I knew this was going to be the right thing. I showed it to her, and of course she fell in love with it. She thought this was great. So um, when she came in, I told her about the position. She said, I will not do this, Archie. I must have Tim Bell. And I said to her very stupidly, all right, Prime Minister, leave it with me. When Tim came in, I said, uh, when, when uh, Norman came in, I said to Norman, Norman, I'll come into this room, I want to show you something. And there on the wall, all the boards of Tim Bell. Oh, he said, this is, who wrote this? I said, Tim. And he, he said, I'm not having it, I'm not having anything to do with it. And then I got him by 
the lapels and I said to him if I said Norman if you don't agree to this we'll lose this you can speech. swear on it. it's a podcast you can swear <laughs> we'll lose this fucking election That's yes we really will I said and we'll all lose and uh, he calmed down a bit at that I think he was quite startled because I'd never laid my hands on anybody <laughs> in my life before or since <laughs> <laughs> happily I hope that um but, um, and then he agreed and went with it. But it, it was a very difficult... Uh, but it didn't end there, did it? Because you then had to persuade Sarchis that they needed to adopt this. Yeah, well, and what I did is they would, under no account, would they take Tim's. So I said, OK, copy it. Because there was another bit of lapel shaking with Morris Sarchi, wasn't there? Yes, there was. <laughs> you got developed a taste for it. <laughs> Well, I, happily, I've lost that taste, but I, you know, I, I think... And he's a big guy. Yeah, they were a big guy, yeah. but, but you, you have well, no it's Norman, idea. Norman isn't, though. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no they're both, Norman I mean, has the most insipid handshake of anyone that I've ever met, which I was so disappointed yes, at. Yes, <laughs> yes, he, he's, he, but he, I mean, he, he's had a difficult time. He certainly has. Yeah. But it, it's, you, you have no idea how worked up. I mean, first of all, I was tired out of my life. I, I'd spent seven, eight weeks, getting literally two or three hours sleep a mm. night. And, and I'm normally a seven hours a man. And then the whole time you have this feeling sometimes when there's a bad prospect and you know it's going to happen. You just know nothing can... Of course, it was all made up, you yeah. see. Uh, and and it, it's like a light was switched on. When they came in and said, no, you're not two percent behind. It looks like we're still twelve percent or whatever the figure was. Suddenly, everything and it was downhill from then onwards to the election. So the majority was actually, I think, one hundred and one, wasn't it? One hundred and two. Um, so all was well. You were then reshuffled. I I went to yes. <laughs> the night the the morning of the reshuffle, I rang them at six o'clock in the morning, and they said, Prime Minister, whatever you do. Please do not send me to health. I had this obsession that because health was in a mess, they were going to ask me to do it. And that was one I had no feel for. And she said, oh, don't worry, David. I know where you're going. And um, we, it was a trooping of the colour. It was one of those days that will always be in your memory. It, it was, you know, the, the trooping of the colour. We were sitting uh, there and the bands were marching. We just won the third election. And then she asked me to go to DTI, Trade and Industry, which I had a bit of a shock because I'd only been thinking of unemployment, but it was my original love. And um, and I had a very happy two and a half, Ken with, came with me, Ken Clark. We privatised even Rover, which had lost money for 17 consecutive years, managed to sell it with a big dowry, and pretty steel that, that we actually floated off the stock exchange um, we, we, and then I told her when it was 10 years you see I'd promised Keith two years and I'd taken 10 years out, out of my life um, and then I found when I stood down that as I'd been Secretary of State and Trade and Industry I knew everything there was to know and I had to wait 15 months before I could take a job mm. So I had 15 months. Um, I could take a job in the United States, but I couldn't take a job here. So I suddenly remembered these tapes. I got them out and got them worked on them. And then I became chairman of, executive chairman of Cable and Wireless. And I spent the next five years running around the world. Uh, that was an exciting time. We took the company to the, uh, uh, the top 10 of the FTSE 100, which, which is... I mean, in the top ten biggest. Uh, and when you told her that you were going, and this was, this was it, sometime in 1989. 89, yes. Just. I mean, that must have come as a bitter blow, because at that point, she had promoted quite a lot of people into her cabinet who weren't of her natural politics, and you would have been seen as one of her main allies. Yes, she would. But I, I think she realised I'd given up ten... Ten, uh, ten years is, is a long yeah. time, you know, to be out... We, we did have that, this awful thing. Um, the day before the reshuffle is due, two days before the reshuffle is due, we have a cabinet subcommittee 
ironically on Hong Kong, and about um, visas or, or passports which we would give to a quarter of a million Hong Kongers in the event that China took over Hong mm. Kong. And the uh, Foreign Office put in a paper saying, yes, we should give it to policemen, to soldiers, to other civil servants. And I put a paper in and said, yes, we should give it to any Hong Kong entrepreneur who wants to bring a quarter of a million pounds and will set up a business in the UK. I was a bit demob happy, <laughs> but I, I still think it would have been wonderful. And it will be wonderful if the Chinese carry on mm. the way they are and they'll come here. When it comes to the last meeting, and of course, I could see already that Margaret and Geoffrey Howe had a bad relationship had developed, and she knocked him all over the place and loved what I want, wanted to suggest. Anyway, the meeting ended without a result. Um, she said, can you spare a few minutes? And I came up to the study, and we reminisced about the 10 years and the changes. And she said to me, David, do you have to go? And it was one of those moments when I realized the very next word I uttered would change the course of, of my life. And I said, no. I said, unless Prime Minister, I can do a particular job. And she said, no, you can't do that from the Lords. So I said, in that case. What was that job? Well, <laughs> I've never actually, I, I was really talking between yeah, Nobody's listening. I, I wanted to turn the Foreign Office into the Department for Overseas Trade. That would have been quite radical. <laughs> <laughs> and I think she would have probably quite liked you to she do it. She loved the idea. Of course, I wouldn't have done it to Foreign Secretary, but I would have changed the whole ethos of the Department mm. towards. But of course, by then, we were already talking Europe. And we, we entered the next 30 years of... And how... I mean, obviously, she was only in power for another year and a bit. Did you stay in touch with her over that period? Uh, well, she was actually in power for about two and a half years. To, uh, no, I mean, from 1989, when you, when, oh, yes, when you left. Yes. Well, I did until I went to Cable and Wireless, and then I was spent a lot of time overseas. Um, I, I met her once at the Chelsea Hospital. Um, there was a very small private lunch, half a dozen people, and she was there. And over lunch, she was quite vague. Um, I mean, she, she was obviously not as well as she mm. used to be. And we sat in the corner and had coffee, just the two of us, and suddenly it was like a switch had been flipped. And she was back at her old self, and she knew everything, and she was... Yeah. And then, 15 minutes later, boom, it went again. Um, and we... Well, one, one of the occasions that I will never, ever forget was privileged to be at her funeral at the actual ceremony. Um, I'd never seen so many people come to Billy Pay. When we walked down the street, um, everybody just very politely clapped. Yeah. Clapped. It was no, I was clear. there. It was it was yeah. it was quite an occasion. Um, yeah. But that wasn't your final foray into no, politics, was it? <laughs> David Cameron tempted you back. I must admit, when I saw the, that announcement, I did think to myself, why would he want to do that? Yeah. Well, I'll I'll tell you why in in, in a moment. When I was at DTI, because I'd run businesses, I knew ministers didn't really communicate properly. So I made a three-line whip that every, after cabinet, every Thursday, used to be Thursday, all the ministers and the whips come in for lunch. And no agenda, we just talk to each other because you communicate that way. Well, way below the salt, far at the end of the table was a young lad who came in from central office. <laughs> I never knew his name. I, no, I knew he was there. Anyway, 21 years later, um, we've gone through the 08, the terrible crisis of 08 to 10. There were unemployment coming all over the place. Businesses were failing all, all over the place. And then I was asked um, by one of the ministers um, who um, used to work for me, he was still in the government, to what I do something about health and safety. Um, and health and safety for a while was a terrible scandal. Uh, 
there were consultants charging a lot of money for a piece of paper yeah. which did no good. So I said I'd come into number 10, and well, I didn't come to number 10, I went into the cabinet office. And I was given meeting room A, which is an enormous meeting room with a table with 36 chairs around it. And in the corner was a desk. And I, I, I say in the book, as I came in, I couldn't stop giggling because there was a story, I'm sure it's not apocryphal, that when John Major was offering Michael Heseltine a job as deputy yeah. minister, um, and um, John said, look, cabinet secretary, uh, see the cabinet secretary, and he'll fix up the accommodation. So Michael goes off, sits down with the accommodation, the cabinet secretary says, it's going to be very difficult. There's a lot of accommodation. Michael said, hmm. He said, this room looks nice. This will do. And they found him a place the next morning. What they did is empty that room out. Excuse me, empty that room out and furnish it properly. For me, they popped a desk in the corner. So I sat there for the first six, nine months. And I built up a small team of civil servants. And we wrote a paper, um, which... And, and the other thing that because I'd been there before. I'd agreed with David that any paper I published would be approved by the Cabinet before it was published, so it wouldn't be pigeonholed. And uh, it went to Cabinet, and it went down very well. And with a day or two, the story stopped. And I was sitting uh, in my desk in, in this great big mausoleum of an office, and Jeremy Hayward, who at that time was running number 10, looked to me, beckoned to me, said, follow me, and he took me downstairs through the door, secret door, into number 10, took me up to the room over the first floor, he said, this is yours. And uh, I stayed there for the only other single purpose office, and within 48 hours, I'd agreed with David that I would become his enterprise advisor. And in many ways, there was good four years of my life as any. Oh, really, that's interesting. Well, I, because I'd been there before, because I'd been in cabinet before, and because I was very old, you, you must remember, I was 36 years older than my prime minister, 40 years older than my chancellor. And I, there was a bit of a myth about me because nobody knew really what went on in the 80s. So these stories developed. So they, they didn't, well, they certainly didn't think I was infallible. They thought I knew a little bit about what I was doing. And I, was, and I knew how the civil service worked, and I was able to get a whole lot of uh, things done. I mean, it, it was inimical to any small businessman. If you started a business at home, and over half do, um, if you weren't careful, they could ask you for capital gains tax on your front room, because it was no longer a no. house. Um, you couldn't have planning permission to work from home all these sorts of things. And then I set up something called Startup Loans, which is a little bit like the old enterprise mm. loan scheme. And all it said is, any age, you could be 60, 80, 20, any age, as long as you're legally of age, and want to start up a business, you have a business plan, you've got a little bit of money, uh, we will give you a five to seven thousand pound loan. And to this day, 75,000 businesses have started that way without it being properly marketed. And I, I believe that it's, that's the one thing government can still do is to go back and help people who are business, a great number of businesses are going to fail when furloughs stop. Mm. Uh, small restaurants, if you think of it, they've lost all their custom. Many will unfortunately fail but they could open up again with not that much investment. And uh, and, and today, I, I think enterprise has come within the psyche of the nation. Young people... Uh, even in education now, youngsters at school learn about enterprise in a way that I never did when yes. I was at school. Well, I made sure every school has an enterprise advisor yeah. who's a local businessman who relates with the school and tells them about it. When that word enterprise, it just permeates your entire yes. life. I mean, I've just remembered your autobiography. It's called The Enterprise Years, <laughs> which you got a lot of stick for at the time, yes, I think, because yes, one of the worst worst book titles. <laughs> yes, yes. A businessman of a cabinet. Yes. yes, yes. I, I really well, did. Which is interesting in itself, in that 
often when people come into politics from the world of business, it just doesn't work out. But, and I'm trying to think of any other people from that background where it really has worked out. But apart from you, I'm struggling to think of anybody. Well, you see, I didn't come from big business, although I had been in big business. When you work in small business, you rarely give orders. You persuade yeah. people. And the whole thing about the civil service or about ministers is you don't give orders. You have to persuade. Yeah. Now, your, your time as an advisor to David Cameron um, finished in an unfortunate way, didn't it? I'm trying to look. I'm trying to look for the quote. You you were accused of saying something, and that sort of led to. Well, it didn't the, actually. Oh, didn't it? Oh, have I misremembered no. this? Oh no, but I had to stand down. Um, yeah. I I think I'd said something like, "Unemployed people have never had it so good." I can't remember if I said no. That was the other time I got into trouble. <laughs> I, but I said something was wrong, um, and in, interestingly, the night. Um, that later that evening, I became the Spectator Parliamentarian Peer of the Year. And uh, I go home after this lunch, and number 10's on the phone. He said, have you seen the headline for tomorrow's papers? And I'd said something wrong again. I can't remember what it was. Um, it, I'd, I'd rather, I forgot what it was. And uh, I said, OK, in that case, if you want me to, I'll go. And I drove down to the country. I mean, how you can go from the heights to the depths in, in, in a, two hours. I sent my resignation letter. Um, Sunday night, David Cameron rang me. He said, David, you're coming back. He said, give it a couple of months and you'll be back. And so I moved to my old offices and I carried on doing the same job. The same civil servants reported to me because I wasn't paid or anything, you know, this. Mm. And we carried on, and after a while, I was allowed back. I'd served my time. Yes, I'm, I have a reputation of, of putting my foot in it. <laughs> but, yes, but you also have a reputation as being a good, good diplomat as well. Yes. Well, yeah, but yes. There'll, there'll always be the, the odd occasion when yes, the diplomacy yes. doesn't work. But, well, look, it's a fantastic book. I hope everybody uh, it, who's interested in the period of the Thatcher government buys it, because it... I think it's really important that people like you do set things out on on the record, and this, and I, I'm I'm sure there'll be one or two people who read it and um, maybe sort of have different recollections, or <laughs> uh, but then it's up to them to put their their views on yeah. on paper, isn't yeah. it? So it is called. Let me just get the title exactly right. Inside Thatcher's Last Election. It's by David Young, published by Bite Back at twenty pounds. David, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Join us again next week. Goodbye.